We end today's show looking at climate and punishment, a new investigation by The Intercept examining how the climate emergency is impacting incarcerated people around the United States. In a moment, we'll be joined by The Intercept's Aline Brown. But first, let's turn to a new video by The Intercept that she narrates about the issue. In the past decade, dangerous weather events have become more frequent and more extreme due to the climate crisis. Both the public and elected officials are only beginning to take the situation seriously. And there's one population in the U.S. facing some of the worst climate threats who almost nobody is talking about, incarcerated people. At that time that I was in the heat, it was a horrible experience. For one year, I sit there just dying. What pains me the most is, like, his life could be taken by a fire that he can't escape from. The U.S. has the highest incarceration rate in the world, and prisoners are some of the most vulnerable to the climate crisis, given that they're at the mercy of a prison system plagued with problems. To find out the scale of the impact, The Intercept mapped more than 6,000 jails, prisons, and detention centers, identifying thousands of facilities where incarcerated people face severe risk from climate change. Our data shows that California, Texas, and Florida have the largest prison and jail populations and are also facing some of the worst dangers from fires, floods, and extreme heat. In the 1980s, the war on drugs spurred a prison boom as scores of new facilities were built in rural areas across the U.S. Wildfires are scorching the West Coast. We found that California has the most facilities in the highest risk category for wildfires. This is uh, one of the first pictures after he was incarcerated. Jamelia Land's husband, Sam, and adopted son, Elijah, are both incarcerated in two different facilities with high wildfire risk. I first became became aware of the severity of what was happening around September. Both my husband and my son knew that the fires were encroaching. You can just see uh, how much smoke this fire is putting up here. Elijah said he could see smoke rolling over the side of the hills. Thank you for using Global Tail Link. Hey, baby. He also told me that there was a massive COVID outbreak, and Elijah is asthmatic. We got smoke in the air. Everybody's coughing. I was in the gym acting with other sick individuals. I was feeling so horrible. It's been the fact that there's a possibility I can die. So it was like one of the worst times of my life. It's going to be okay, baby. It's going to um, be okay. Love you, Mama. I love you too, baby. And so as I started researching, I realized I haven't heard anything about an evacuation policy. And I became very alarmed. I asked him to go and talk to a correctional officer to verify if there was, in fact, a plan in place for the inmate population. But he was like, Mom, I had one of them laugh in my face and tell me, what do you mean? Like, we, we leave and go home. Y'all stay here. And whatever happens, happens. Although he didn't pull the trigger, Elijah was convicted under California's felony murder law for a 2016 robbery that resulted in the deaths of three people. The controversial rule was revised only months later. It's one thing having to sit and worry about a fire, but it's another thing to know that this kid should not be sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. We know that California has been a hotbed for wildfires for years. Governor Gavin Newsom has, in fact, implemented some legislative changes. However, it's just not enough. Now his mind has to worry, am I even going to live long enough to see the end of this fight? We call ourselves a civilized society. Where is the civilized in that? Without transparency about the details of emergency plans, incarcerated people and their loved ones simply aren't convinced that the state will protect them when the flames draw too close to the prison walls. As the climate crisis worsens, another major threat to prisoners is heat, especially in southern states like Texas, the state with the largest jail and prison population. Among Texas's 180,000 prisoners was Justin Phillips, who was recently released after nearly 
five years in prison, including a stint at the Cofield unit, which had no air conditioning. Look, y'all, there's Justin Phillips. Right, come on, He's in the car. I was incarcerated at units with no air conditioner, and the temperatures were getting to 130 degree margin. There's nothing you can do. It's like being locked in a hot car. You can't go nowhere. You're in a, a little eight by 10 cell. There were so many people committing suicide and drugs were running rampant because people wanted to escape. And if you're not strong-minded, you're not gonna make it. It was a horrible experience, especially be me being sick. In 2016, Justin was diagnosed with a rare kidney condition. He needs a range of medications and multiple dialysis treatments every week to survive. At that time that I was in the heat, bins of my kidneys filled, I gained a lot of fluid. The guards, they're supposed to pass out water every couple hours. If you get too hot, they're supposed to take you to a cool shower and all that. That's, that's a myth. I've never seen it happen. Sometimes they would take me down there, my blood pressure might be 200 over 160 and they just send me right back to my cell. And high blood pressure will kill your kidneys. My kidney function dropped dramatically. I just accepted the fact that I was gonna die. This is when I was fighting to get a move to an air conditioned unit. You have to have documentation or it's your word against theirs. I knew if it wasn't for me fighting for him, he wouldn't make it out alive. And I started a group. I am the founder of Texas Prisons Air Conditioning Advocates. We fight for what's right. Then I saw how big the problem really was. This is a letter that I had wrote to Greg Abbott. The politicians know what's going on, but honestly, it's Greg Abbott that doesn't care. You're like knocking on a brick wall because nobody's wanting to reply, no one's wanting to respond, but finally they did. We had a bill for humane conditions in two different sessions. We made it further every year. From there, things have stalled. Governor Greg Abbott and Republican lawmakers killed advocates' latest bill and continue to stand in the way of climate protection for the state prison system, where as of 2020, less than a third of all facilities were fully air conditioned. And the problem goes well beyond Texas. Nearly every facility in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and Oklahoma suffers from blistering heat. Yet none of those states' corrections departments require universal air conditioning. Red or blue, governors and lawmakers around the country are failing the people placed under their watch. The Biden administration has tools to help reduce the impact of climate change on incarcerated people through federal oversight, but has chosen not to intervene. At this rate, prison conditions are set to get worse as the climate crisis intensifies, leading some experts to suggest that the only meaningful mitigation strategy is to shut these facilities down. For Justin and Casey, the effects of the heat at the Cofield unit were already enough to be life-changing. I firmly believe that if he wouldn't have been in that atmosphere, he wouldn't be in the condition that he's in now. I got a 40% chance to live five years, and uh, hopefully I'll be getting on a transplant list, but nothing's happened so far. I feel like they gave me a possible death sentence. He's got everything that he could possibly need. Jamelia Land is still fighting for Elijah's release, but her family recently found some relief from the climate risks they face. We are anxiously awaiting the release of my husband. I'm nervous, my adrenaline is running. Um, I'm hungry, <laughs> I'm sleep deprived, uh, but finally he's on his way. There's a van, there's a, there's a van, there's a van, there's a van. There's a van! There's a van! He's coming! He's coming! You excited, Peanut? <laughs> Come on, baby! Come on, baby! I love you, baby. I love you too, sweetheart. It feels good, like a new beginning. I'm also ready to work, because there's so much that needs to change with this system. And this is gonna be an atom bomb of hope. 
for Elijah. Because now we're both going to be fighting side by side to bring him home. A new video produced by The Intercept as part of an investigative project titled Climate and Punishment, written by Aline Brown, who joins us now. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Aline. Uh, an amazing report, and you've done so much more, the series of investigative print pieces as well for The Intercept. Talk about what most surprised you in this reporting, as you deal with extreme heat, as you deal with flooding, um, and as you deal with fires. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that surprised me the most was, you know, of, of course, we found that thousands of facilities are facing really serious risks right now, and people are experiencing horrific impacts um, today. Um, and th this is going to get much worse. But I think one of the things that surprised me was that it's not just the climate crisis that we're looking at. It's this crisis of mass incarceration. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the film, a lot of these facilities were built in the 80s and 90s and are deteriorating. Um, to some degree, it, it seems that um, environmental crisis is sort of inherent to this system. Um, and so I think these facilities, our mass incarceration system is at something of a crossroads where, um, you know, you could say, okay, the climate crisis is going to make things so much worse, so we need to invest billions of dollars into the mass incarceration system. Or you could consider that maybe this isn't the question we should be asking. Um, you know, like the climate crisis, uh, the mass incarceration system takes um, vulnerable people and puts them in even more vulnerable situations. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are arguing that um, to meaningfully address uh, the climate crisis that these facilities are facing, um, we need to be letting people out and shutting facilities down. Uh, you know, you have the story of Elijah and his father in prison. At the end, we see his, fa um, uh, his father released, um, and now they'll fight for Elijah's release. But Elijah has asthma, and he sees the fire coming over the hill. Uh, everyone is coughing, uh, and he asks uh, um, corrections guard, what's the plan for evacuation? Um, you've said California says evacuation procedures are um, uh, you know, top secret, because they would compromise uh, the security of the prisoners. What about this and what, in fact, needs to happen? Mm, yeah. I mean, this is something we heard from family members of incarcerated people and people who are currently and in formerly incarcerated over and over again. This idea, you know, this sense that maybe there isn't really an evacuation plan or an emergency plan, um, and maybe the, the things that are in place to save people's lives are not really sufficient. Um, you know, the corrections departments in all the states we, we talk to, of course, say, of course we have a plan. You know, it, it's secret. We can't tell you. You know, these are the people themselves are security risks. So, you know, how could we share the plans? Um, but I think for a lot of people, especially who have recently survived the COVID crisis in prisons um, and have, you know, spent time seeing how healthcare systems in prisons, you know, nothing, nothing really works there. So, for them to trust that the secret plans are going to be effective is, you know, something that is beyond possible. Uh, let me ask you, you write that, according to the data reviewed by The Intercept, by the end of the century, thousands of prisons across the United States, from New Jersey to Minnesota, will experience the kind of heat Texas sees today, and nobody seems to be ready. And then you talk about the flooding threats. This is not just coastal prisons. Yep, that's right. So, you know, a lot of the prisons that we, prisons, jails, and detention centers that we identified with um, significant flooding risk are in places like West Virginia and Ohio and Tennessee. Um, you know, so we like to imagine that this is just about hurricanes on the Gulf Coast, but it's certainly not. And um, again, you know, back to this issue 
to you of deteriorating facilities, um, we also found a lot of facilities that had appeared to have low flood risk actually having a history of flooding. And, um, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter if you're in a flood zone or not, if the roof is broken and the windows don't close um, or the sewage system is falling apart. Um, so, you know, I think that we should be looking even beyond the facilities that we've identified as high risk um, when we think about what the climate crisis will mean for people who are incarcerated. So, as we wrap up, talk about the climate and punishment database that you've developed. Mm. And finally, as you point out, this isn't about um, uh, fixing all of these problems. It's fixing the major problem, overarching issue of mass incarceration in this country, and who gets imprisoned in these, uh, in some cases, ice boxes, and in other cases, um, boxes that bake human beings. Yeah. So, I mean, this database is something that we're really proud of and we really hope can be a tool for organizers, policymakers, you know, reporters and um, family members of people who are trapped inside these facilities. Um, my colleague Akil Harris and I spent about a year um, basically mapping um, this database of 6,500, more than 6,500 facilities against um, separate databases of flood risk, wildfire risk, and um, heat risk. And we were able to put the, them all on this interactive map where you can search um, most facilities um, or search individual communities and come up with um, you know, uh, kind of mini profiles of the facilities with the risk levels that they appear to be facing. We have to leave um, it there, but we're going to link uh, to that uh, climate and punishment data map at democracynow.org. Uh, Aline Brown, we thank you so much for being with us of The Intercept, a part of this investigative project. Absolutely remarkable. Um, that does it for our show. I'm Amy Goodman. Stay safe. Wear a mask. Wearing a mask is an act of love. <laughs>